Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Two years ago today, the world changed forever when someone said, you guys can't meet in person. That's two years ago already. I am glad that seems to be diminishing. But if you're here and you want to wear a mask, if you're here and you don't want to wear a mask, all is good. No shame. Do whatever feels right and most safe to you. I am glad that you are all here. Those of you that are joining us online, welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad if you want to fill out a Connect card and let us know any updates in your life so that we can be praying for you. Please do so. They're on the seat back in front of you. Join us for our ongoing Wednesday Lenten services. Lent is that season where we move with Jesus towards Jerusalem and towards Holy Week. Starting on 327, we will be doing communion in the old way, the former way, the best way, the good way, in all services. But to ramp up to do that for hundreds of people, we need dozens, maybe even hundreds of people to serve and to pour all the little cups and put out all the wafers and those kinds of things. So if you're willing to be part of the new and growing worship teams and communion teams, please sign up for that. One last thing, on when we come to the table in a little while after the message, we serve it in a way that's in tinction. Most of you know that if you're a guest with us this morning, when you come forward, you can take the wafer and you can dip it in either the light-colored liquid, which is the grape juice, or the dark-colored, which is wine. That way I don't have to say all those instructions right around the table. We can just come to the table. It is good to see you. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, this is your day. You invite us into your presence. You call us to worship in your house. You call us to love one another because you created us for each other and for you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege and honor of worshiping and fellowshipping together. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. to worship. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created. We are your people, and you are our God. Amen. Today's scripture is Genesis chapter 1, verses 25 through 31. 
the awe-inspiring in in initiation of the world, the dramatic emergence of the word, and the promise of God to be con constant relationship with creation. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their, their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according, according to the, their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So good God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule it over, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with a seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and the, all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that he had all that he had made and it it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. you to stand for the gospel reading. Hear the words of the gospel according to St. Mark, beginning at the first chapter, verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I thank you for your word. It's faithful and true. It's deep and mighty and mysterious and powerful. Transform us by the power of your word through the transforming work of your spirit to your glory in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to be seated.
We live in serious times. So what does the Bible have to say about these serious times? We are in a series about covenants. The covenants of the Bible, the promises that God makes to us, the promises he asks us to make to him, the promises we make to each other and to creation, and that is the unfolding story of the Bible. And we live in serious times because we have failed the covenant, and we continue to fail this covenant, the first covenant. It's my privilege to talk to you today about the promise of Eden. I don't know about you, but I love starting a new book. There's something wonderful about going to those first few pages and saying, where will it take me? Who are the characters? What trouble will they get in? What's the story going to be like? What are the plot twists? Well, we turn to those first few pages of this book that many of you have had for a long time, and perhaps it's been a while since you turned to those first few pages of Genesis, but we do today because it's here in the pages of Genesis in chapter 1 and 2 and 3, we find out about the first covenant, the covenant of Eden. This is first, and it's from this one that all the other covenants flow. The covenant of Noah and the covenant of Abraham and the covenant of Moses, all of those flow from this covenant and from our failure. It begs the question, what if we wouldn't have failed the covenant of Eden? It's a worthy thought experiment, but we did. We failed. All others come from this. If you don't understand this first opening act, you really don't get the rest of the Bible all the way up to Revelation because Revelation is simply a recapitulation or a redoing of Genesis. Sometimes I listen to Christians and we talk about when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But the scripture actually says that somewhere in the future, God will bring a new Jerusalem and a new heaven and it will meet earth and the two will be one just like it is in our prayer on earth as it is in heaven. And so Revelation is simply going back to Genesis and saying, let's make it like it was supposed to be. Let's do it right this time. This covenant, the covenant of Eden, is the first one, and it's the only one that's made before sin enters the world. This is a promise out of the goodness of God. In fact, at the end of Genesis, he says, you know, it's good. Wait a second. It's very good. Matter of fact, at the end of creation, God says, it's, it's so good, I think you should take a day off called the Sabbath. Don't do any of your stuff. Don't do busy work. Don't go to work. Just enjoy it. Because it's very good, and it will be very good for you to enjoy it, because you're part of creation. It's in this first covenant that we have the first home. And we hear a first heart-to-heart -heart talk between God and his people. It's a first in so many ways. It all starts here. But I want to make sure that we understand what it means to be in covenant. It's a little bit different than to be in a contract. It's a little bit different than to get a proposal and sign the contract. This is personal. When God enters a covenant, he says, here's a part of me, and I want to party you. This is in blood. This is in being. This is essential. To take this apart will tear us apart. That's why the marriage words say, and they will become one flesh. Have you ever tried to take a steak apart? It kind of gets all torn up. And that's what happens. So let's make sure we understand the covenant. Quite often, matter of fact, dozens of times I have stood right about here, and there's been a couple right about here. And we do this wonderful thing called a wedding. And there are vows. I do, I will, I promise. I do, I will, I promise. And there are vows. 
And then I say something like, and now by the power vested in me by the state of Illinois, which means very little to me, and by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means everything to me, I pronounce you, if I'm taken out right in that moment, they're not married. Until I say, I now pronounce you husband and wife. This would be a very good time to kiss. It's a covenant. I've been married to nine different women. Same wife. Because she's changed at least nine different times, and so have I. And we said 45 years ago, I do, I will, I promise. And sometimes when new couples come to me and say, Pastor Glenn, would you do our wedding? Yes. And I do some marriage counseling and I tell them this. It's not your love that will sustain the marriage. It's your marriage that will sustain the love. It's a covenant before God and these witnesses. It's a covenant. There's something deep, powerful, Profound. Let's take it one step further. Many years ago, 1976, August 18th, as a matter of fact, I said, I promise to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So a little over a year ago when I saw some people invading my capital, I almost got in the car and headed that direction because you don't let go of that covenant just because I'm not in the Navy. There's something. You talk to any service person that I know that's worthy of those words and they will tell you, yeah, it kind of doesn't leave you. It's a covenant. Let's talk about another one. How many of you have heard the words NATO in the last two or three weeks? Turns out that's a covenant formed in 1949, I think. Twelve countries said, we covenant. If you get hurt, I'm in with you. If you get hurt, I'll help. They're all around us. Covenants. Sometimes they're so omnipresent we forget them. And that is true of this first covenant. It permeates everything else, including your very next breath. God so made the universe that there's this wonderful thing called air that you can breathe. And without it, you don't stand a chance. It's covenant. God says, I'll uphold my end. I have established this world that you can live in, and it's really, really very, very good. And if you uphold your end, it'll go really well. And if you don't, hmm. Let me illustrate it this way. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at the fitness center, and I was done with my workout. I don't know how many of you have done a workout recently where you go, I did it. I crushed it. Woo, I feel so good. And I sat in the sauna and I felt good. And I'm like, I'm going to crush this day. This is awesome. And I was waiting for a ride to come get me because of a car situation. Anyway, some come, someone was coming to get me. And I got a text from them saying, I'm almost here. And I'm sitting in back of this kind of wall at Lifetime Fitness Center. There's a wall in back of the check-in area. And there are some tables. And there's TV over here. And about 40 feet that way, there's a door. And so I, I look. Yep, sure enough, I see the car. Got big plate glass windows and door, and I pick up my bag, and I'm like, okay, here comes the car right towards me. I can see it through the window. And I have my phone, and I'm like, boom! Oh, it was loud. And you can't see it now because it hides behind these little gray hairs on my mustache. But I had a, I mean, a deep gash and a big old purple knot right here, and I thought my nose was broken. And the person at the front desk said, Glenn, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. And I got in the car, and the driver said, sir, do you want me to take you to the hospital? Blood was pouring out of my face. 
See, I tell you all those shark diving stories. I wish I could tell you that I was injured diving with sharks. But I wasn't. I walked into a glass wall. The door's here. The glass wall's here. But I was paying attention to something else. And I walked into the covenant. Don't go through this door. Go through this door. And those are all around us. This covenant, sometimes it's invisible, but it hangs in every breath that you take right now. And it's as important as marriage vows. It's as important as a constitution. It's as important as NATO, because none of those things exist without this first covenant. And it works like this. We are in a covenant with God, with each other, and with creation. And that's a part we tend to forget about. And we turn it into this individual moral crusade where I should be a better person. When Adam and Eve fall, we turn that into this moral crusade. And it is that, but it is so much bigger than that. Because it turns out that Adam and Eve owe themselves an allegiance to one another. And they have an allegiance to their own body. If I sin against my body, it's a sin against creation. When I don't treat myself well, when I don't take care of myself, it's a sin against creation. When I hurt you, it's a sin against creation. When I see someone else hurting you, and I do nothing about it, it's a sin of omission. And all of these things come out of this first covenant. Because it turns out if I come over here and I hurt Pete, I hurt him. But if you sit in your pew and let me hurt him, you hurt you. Because that's a sin of omission. And if you sit and you watch and you have this ethical conundrum of should I help, should I not, should I help, should I not? That's called moral injury, and it gets added to it. And then if the story goes out that Pete got hurt, but we try to cover it up because the system says we should cover it up, then even if you don't know that's what happened, you're guilty of systemic sin. And that's what happens in Eden. Adam and Eve sin against God, against the garden, against the vow, against each other. And there's a total breakdown of, in the Hebrew, shalom. The Hebrew shalom means way more than peace. It means flourishing. God says, have my shalom. Flourish. Where instead of hurting you, I do my best to let your gifts flourish, to let you grow, to become all that God made you to be, me to be, and us to be in relationship. Let's unpack this a little bit because the story unfolds in a powerful way. God creates Adam and says, hey, the whole world is yours. All the animals are yours, but they don't have names. Youth. You could do that. Adam, name the animals. To name something is, a to, is to give it a category, to give it dignity, to, uh, to say, there's a giraffe, and there's a bear, and there's a shark, and there's an eagle, is to give them space and distinction, to say, you are honorable, you have a name, you fit in the created order, and I am a human being, and you are animals, and I am part of you, and you are part of me. I am not above you. We are together in this wonderful thing called Eden. And apparently there's something about Eden that requires the giraffe and the elephant and the horse and the shark and the eagle and the human to coexist. But then God comes back, and Adam's lonely. This is a huge point. God recognizes that there's something about the giraffe and the horse and the elephant and the shark and the eagle that are cool for the human being, but not ultimate. He needs somebody like him. 
He needs somebody who can look him in the eye and understand, I'm human, you're human. We are in this together. Who can learn language and create culture. And so God says, you know what, why don't you take a nap? And then God makes Eve. And the words Adam and Eve mean first man, first woman. First humans. Now here's the thing. Adam and Eve were created before sin ever entered the world. Adam was lonely before sin. Adam had God's full presence and all the animals, and he still needed something else. Now be careful. Don't go out and say, Pastor Glenn said we don't need God. That's not what I said. I said Adam had a walking, talking relationship with God, and there was still more that he needed. He needed a human being. Because a human being understands what it's like to be human in the garden, to till the garden. And so loneliness comes in way before, apparently loneliness isn't a sin. Apparently it's not a sin for me to say, I need you. And you need me. In fact, if you unwind it, it's a sin to not say that. So God establishes this first community of human beings and animals with himself in the middle and says, now here's what I want. I want you to go out. I want you to multiply, increase. And the Hebrew words here that get translated into English, it's unfortunate, the words dominion and subdue, those are not the best words. What God says is, I want you to go out and be royal stewards. The original use of the word stewardship, time, talent, treasure. I want you, Adam and Eve, to steward this garden. Now think about the role of a steward. The steward doesn't own the place. The steward has a covenant. It's like a mortgage. Here's the owner You are the steward, Adam and Eve. Care for the earth. Care for the animals. Care for each other. Care for the garden. Do work. Work is established as a high and holy thing. And out of that, all of our vocations have come. It is a good thing to work and to do it well. To be a salesman and to be persuasive in an ethical and kind way way with integrity is glory to God. To be a healthcare worker and care for another human being and to do it with effectiveness and elegance comes right out of the covenant of Eden where God says, be a royal steward. To be a teacher, to be an Uber driver, To be all these things comes out of this covenant of Eden where God says, I have given you capacity. I have given you ability. I have given you a stage on which to play. Now go. Wow. What a wonderful first covenant. But Adam and Eve are told one thing not to do. Comes a little bit later in the story. Now Adam and Eve... There's a couple of trees, tree of life, tree of good and evil. Do not eat the fruit from that tree in the center of the garden. So what happens? I have four grandchildren that live with me. If I want to make sure they'll do something, tell them not to. (laughs) It even works with chores. I have to kind of wordsmith it a little bit. Don't you dare use that vacuum. Don't. Don't do it. Don't you sweep that kitchen floor. Uh Uh-uh. I dare you. Oh, man, they run for the broom. The older ones are, they've caught on now. They're like, no, Pa, not not so much. (laughs) Don't eat this fruit. It doesn't matter what kind it is. There's something about the action itself. It's not in the fruit 
This is no magic mushroom at the center of the garden. The enlightenment comes when they realize God has given them agency and trust. I trust you. What happens when you trust somebody? They can break it. What happens when I say I do, I will, up here at the altar? I can break that covenant. It's the intimacy of trust, and God gives them trust. And they break it, and in the breaking of it, they discover good and evil, and they do not have the capacity to handle that. And God sends them east of Eden and puts a angel with a flaming sword and says, you can't get back to this place. Now you've got to do it in a way that's under a curse, but you brought it on yourself. So last week, I was with some clients in Nashville, senior living, 46 communities with about 3,500 seniors that are being cared for, memory care and assisted living and independent living and people who are in that last couple chapters of life and they need a place where they're safe and where they can be cared for. And we're talking as we're hearing about the global economy going through the upheavals that come from the tail end of COVID and now from a war rippling out in Europe and from all the sanctions that come. And then after that, I had a conversation with another client who's a president of a steel distribution company. And he said, Glenn, it's crazy. When we met in November, we knew that prices were going to go down, and they went down by about $1,000 a ton. But in the last two weeks, they've gone up that same amount and more. I've never seen the markets in this much tumult. Why? Because it turns out pig iron comes from Russia and Ukraine. And as much of a digital world as we live in, you kind of need steel to do stuff everywhere you go. And that's going to ripple into the five projects that this senior living company has shovels in the ground because they got to build with some steel. And then I got off the phone with them and I talked to a CEO of another client who's in cloud security. How many of you know what that is? Some of you are thinking, clouds, do they need to be secure? No, that's the thing called the internet where, you know, when you pick up your phone and you go on Facebook or you go to your airport app, and it's all up in the cloud somewhere. And it turns out there's a lot of bad guys in the world, some of them Russian, who want to shut that down. And so his business is thriving. My steel CEO said, here's the thing, we're going to have one of our best years ever this year. I can already see it. Why? Because wars take a lot of steel. The covenant of Eden playing out on a daily basis in ways that we see and in other ways that we don't. The good thing, and all these CEOs and I said the same thing, the good thing that we all see right now is if we could maybe all just disabuse ourselves of the fact that we can be an isolated place, we'll be Americans, well, we'll be Russians, well, we'll be, you name the category. In Eden, where were the national lines in Eden? Where is the line between the United States and Mexico, between the United States and Canada. It's not there. And between COVID and the global economy right now, we realize that we need each other in Eden. We are all bound up and wrapped together, whether we like it or not. And when one end of the covenant gets broken, it ripples into the rest of the world, and my neighbor is affected. That's why the great Shema that goes back a thousand years before Jesus. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because the Hebrew paradigm of shalom is holistic, and it comes out of Eden. And where one end of the covenant is broken because people aren't stewarding it well, it impacts other people. I heard a scientist the other day, he's talking about longevity. It's amazing what happens when you're 64, you start listening to those things a little bit more. 
And my grandparents all passed in their 90s. My dad passed when he was 90. So I can't control everything, but if I don't do something dumb to myself, I could have another 30 years on this planet. And the neuroscientist from Harvard was saying, we are extending lifespan and we will continue to extend lifespan. And for those children that are being born right now, they will live into their 120s. No question. And some of us are going, nah. You know what the average lifespan was in 1900? About 50. That eliminates most of us in this room. And if you'd have been in 1900 and someone had said, no, you're going to live to be 80 or 90, you said, no. Nah. It's happening, friends, all around us. But here's what that neuroscientist said. He said, we have the technology to extend lifespan, but I don't know that we've done anything to extend quality of life. The reason for having that long life. Eden shows up everywhere. You can't get away from it. I keep banging into these walls of Eden. And God has created us in his image. That means I look like God. The giraffes do not. The horses do not. The whales do not. The eagles do not. As glorious and wonderful as the entire natural order is, there's something about humans that we have been given God's image. That means when I go out into this world, I am to reflect the goodness of the Creator. And when I don't, I fall short, in Paul's words. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. And this extends to the way I treat my neighbor, the way I treat myself, and the way I treat creation. It's one of the hardest things to teach because it's all about sometimes things that you don't see. It's all about this system. It's all working together. And somehow I get the idea that as an individual, if I just keep my head down and keep my own moral purity, then that's good enough. It's not. I must care about my neighbor. You've heard me tell one or two diving stories. And you've seen some pictures that I've taken. One night I'm going to come and show you all the pictures that I normally don't. I'll show you the pictures of what the reefs used to look like in 1974 when I started diving. They don't look like that anymore. They're brown, and they have algae all over them. Matter of fact, where I learned how to scuba dive in the Florida Keys, the only coral reef system in the continental United States used to be a destination You'd send postcards and say, hey, mom, I'm in the Keys. Look at this brain coral and elkhorn coral and staghorn coral loaded with fish. Now, not so much on those reefs. Now they sink big Navy ships way out deep for the, wait for it, artificial reef program. And here's the deal. It works in a way that even if you don't think you're touched by that, you are. You are. We send missionaries to Honduras and Guatemala. We have opinions about people coming north across our borders. But what you don't know is that the second largest reef system in the world is the Pan American, Pan American reef system off of Central America. And as fish populations die and the coral reefs die, one out of seven of all those Central American people who used to be able to make money from fishing no longer can. And they have to feed their families, so they say, well, I can't make it there. And they turn back around to land, and there's no jobs, except there's this guy who lives up on the top of the hill. And he's got a really nice house. He's in the pharmacology business, let's say. Most of his market is in North America, in places like Naperville. And so those guys go to work for him. And so when missionaries go down there, you know that one out of every seven cars on the road is in the drug trade. And it turns out all of that happened way back in the 60s when our country, and you can read about this on the CIA website, did some things that maybe weren't so good because we destabilized a duly elected government 
and it sent Central America into a 30-year civil war. 700,000 Mayan Indians died at the same time that the poppy crop was growing, and people were going, hey, you know what you can do with those poppies? You can turn that into this white powder, and there's these gringos who are listening to this rock and roll stuff. Yeah, let's take it up there. And it all works together in a system. You push on one end of the system on the reef, and you will experience it over here. And then we get people in our society who categorize that. If you are pro-environment, you must be a liberal. If you are pro-economy, you must be one of those conservatives but they work together. It doesn't say in here, and God made them to be conservative and liberal. Liberal and conservative made he them. It says human in his image. And so I must care for the environment because it affects you. I must care for my neighbor because it affects the other neighbor over there. When I do my work, I must do it giving glory to God in a way that honors the people that I'm doing my work with. That is the covenant of Eden. So what does that have to do with the gospel? Turns out everything, everything. Jesus, in the gospel reading that I read just a few minutes ago, what's the first thing he does after he's baptized? First of all, heaven opens there's my son, I'm well pleased with you. And he goes out where? Into the wilderness to be what? Tempted by Satan. What happened in the garden? Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan. Only Jesus doesn't back down. Jesus is like, Satan, no. I'm not going to short circuit the process. I'm not going to go for your visions of glory and gold. I'm not going to win by coercive power. I'm going to win by spiritual power. No, no, no. But Mark's gospel picks up one little detail. It says, and the wild animals were with him. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the new Adam. Jesus Christ is the new Eve. And the wild animals go, Hey, did you hear who's walking around the wilderness? It's the Lord of creation. We haven't seen him walking around the garden since Eden. He's here. The kingdom of God is here. And when the Lord of glory is present, you just back up and bow. And the wild animals recognize who he is. And Jesus picks up the covenant of Eden. And says, I'm going to redo it. And I'm going to show you how to do it. And I'm going to die. I'm going to wrap myself in sin and death, which are the penalties for breaking the covenant. And I'm going to take them to that cross. And I'm going to take the title deed to this earth and to your life. I'm taking it to the cross. And I'm going to win it back for you. And we're going to build a new kingdom. And I will be with you. Even to the end of the age. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of all creation. He is the Lord of Eden. He is the Lord of your life and asks you today, will you pick up your role as a royal steward in your corner of the world? That is our covenant. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for this day and for your son, Jesus Christ. We could talk about the ramifications of this covenant all day, all week, all of our lives. How can we conduct ourselves in this world in a way that honors your creation for all of its beauty and all of its power? How can we honor our economic need in a way that it balances it with creation's need, with my neighbor's need? Those are not easy questions. But we must pick up the role of royal steward. We must go out into the world and say, how can I do this in a way that honors God and honors this covenant? 
Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. stand and affirm your faith with me using the ancient but always powerful and relevant words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated. My name is Laura Jean Martin, and I'm the high school ministry leader at Good Shepherd. Dodge for Doe is a citywide fundraiser dodgeball tournament held here at Good Shepherd that Student Ministries puts on as a fundraiser, but also an outreach for the community. The purpose of Dodge for Doe is to raise funds for our students that are going on missions this summer. This year, we're going to Port Huron, Michigan with an organization called Group Work Camp. We've been partnering with them for years. Missions is a value of Good Shepherd, always has been. 
And so wanting that opportunity for students to be able to be part of going on mission, going and serving somewhere. And so knowing that our students don't have the funds, we want them to own it by raising funds on their own. So Dodger Verdot has such a positive impact on our community here at Good Shepherd, but also in Naperville in the greater area. It's such a fun and easy event to be invited into. We have a lot of families that have never stepped foot in a church or Good Shepherd that come in to play. Also at this time for our faith family, for Good Shepherd, it was a time to just have fun, to let loose, have fun, play some dodgeball, and just be and gather with each other, see each other. I love what one of our parents said. It's like, church is happening right here, right now, in the gym. Another impact this event has is that our community is able to invest in our students. We had amazing partners with Intention and Kids Matter, Edward Jones, Ben Wearsome. These sponsors invested in this event knowing that they're sending students on mission. It's important our students know they're valued. They matter. They have impact. And we as Good Shepherd and the community get to send them. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Eden. We ask your forgiveness for the way that we have treated each other, treated ourselves, treated your animal kingdom, treated your global world. We ask forgiveness for the way that we have broken the covenant. But Lord, you promise that we can, in your power, be restorers of our corner of the covenant of Eden in our world. Lord, so much around the world today is walking into the walls of your covenant. Our minds go to the Ukraine and to Russia. Lord, I pray prayers that I don't even know how to give words to. The grand patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church said just a couple of weeks ago that this war is being conducted in your name and for your glory. How can that be? Lord, forgive us when we justify our breakdown of the covenant in the name of the covenant giver. Lord, people are being displaced, close to three million refugees who don't have a home, who are on the move, almost always women and children and sick and people who cannot move easily. They are always the first affected. Lord, for all those fighters on the ground, the trained soldiers and the regular citizens that are being trained, sometimes the covenant requires forced and evil. And this seems like that kind of time. Lord, what do the nations of NATO do knowing there's a covenant all around them? I do not have easy answers. But I pray that you confront Putin and his 
closest advisors with the reality and that you bring this war to an end sooner than we can, even with the toughest of sanctions. And for, for those 25 or 30 other places around the globe where there is conflict and armed aggression, where the covenant of Eden is so far in the rearview mirror. Lord, for all of those ways that we continue to make the world harder to live in because of the way we live in it. Lord, here locally, for people who are struggling with mental health, with opioids, with addictions, let us be a church on the front lines offering hope, safety, care, community. For those people glad that COVID seems to be at its lowest ebb and yet still reeling from two years. And Lord, people reeling from the economic reality of inflation, these are serious times. But your people have been called to live through serious times before. Lord, we lift up those members of the military and by extension, police and Coast Guard and those that stand on the front lines of good and evil, of breakdown of law. We pray for their safety, for their mental health as they try to navigate strange world. Lord, for Naval School Class 2207, and for all of those specific requests that we have, that we're holding in our hearts for people with names, for people who are in relationship with us, those specific medical and financial and family prayers, we lift them all up to you and we recognize that we cannot make sense of this mess. But you can. And your word says that you call us to be royal stewards, even in the hard times. Lord, give us your strength, give us your power, give us your forgiveness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Would you, with me, confess to the Lord. Loving God, we turn to you and confess that we have not always remembered to follow you in our daily lives. Sometimes we shut you out and think only of ourselves. Forgive us, remind us that we are your servants. Help us to always walk and act as such. Let us be your hands and feet in a hurting world. Amen. We take a moment for a silent reflection. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The good news is that when we turn to God and ask his forgiveness. We are cleansed of our sins even before the words are out of our mouths. Be reassured that God knows our hearts and wants nothing more than for us to look solely to him as the source of our life and salvation. Amen.
the Lord of all creation was betrayed. He took bread, broke it, and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat, all of you. He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, this cup is my blood shed for you. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember that I have laid down my life for you. We believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the real presence of Jesus Christ is in this room. Martin Luther said, in, with, and under the elements. Somehow Jesus meets us and offers to go to that deepest place in us and redeem and heal and transform and give us power to live out our call as his royal stewards. We come to the table expecting to meet the Lord who the wild animals recognized as the Lord of glory. Come to the table with that spirit in mind. Would you pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite our communion servers forward.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. We stand for the benediction. Lord God, give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom to be royal stewards of all that you have given us, to care for each other, to care for ourselves, to care for your creation, and to give you all the glory in Jesus' strong name by the power of his spirit and all God's people said. Amen. Let's sing our closing song. and sisters in Christ, go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.